Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for joining this Zoom presentation presented by the Beverly Hills Bar Association and in particular the litigation section. Um, I want to welcome you all here today. We have over 100 people logging in so far and more will be joining us. This is a one hour program and you will have the opportunity to ask questions. So uh, at the bottom of your screen, you will see a Q&A button. If you have any questions at any time, please feel free to click on that, write in your question, and we'll be taking questions from 1.15 onwards. Today is the second in our series entitled War Stories, in which we feature prominent trial lawyers talking about their legendary cases. And we're very honored and pleased today to have Patricia Glazer of Glazer Weil speaking about the Boxing Helena trial, which came back from 1992 to 1993. Uh, Patricia is the head of Glazer Weil's litigation department and is a respected trial lawyer who provides general counsel advice as well to publicly and privately held companies across a range of industries, including IP, real estate, entertainment, banking, and securities. Her clients include Fortune 500 companies, major studios, real estate investors and developers, financial institutions, and high profile entertainers and public figures. Uh, we probably know her best as one of our leading trial lawyers. She's earned the prestigious honor of legal legend, power lawyer, and Hall of Fame legend from the Hollywood Reporter. Outside the law, she serves on the board of several prominent arts organizations, including the Los Angeles Music Center Theater Group and the Gaffin Playhouse, and our interest in the arts extend to producing plays and other theatrical places. Uh, she received her bachelor's degree from American University and a law degree from Rutgers. At Rutgers, she served on law, law review and as president of the Student Bar Association. Um, Patty, we're very pleased, very honored to have you here today. I wonder if we could kick off by asking you to please give us an overview of the Boxing Helena case and the trial. Uh, absolutely. Uh, I was referred back a thousand years ago um, by a mutual friend, Carl Massacone, who was the producer of Boxing Helena, came to see me about um, Kim Basinger backing out of the film Boxing Helena. Boxing Helena probably not one of the world's great films and may not be interesting to everybody, uh, was a film where uh, a doctor gets obsessed with um, a patient and proceeds to, at the end of the movie, ha have taken off uh, arms, legs, and the torso remains with the head, and he puts it in a box on his dining room table. Not exactly appetizing film, but that's what it was. Uh, we had, um, uh, there was lots of discovery uh, one of the things that was interesting to me uh, is that there was um, Kim Basinger's agent and, and, and lawyer, actually, there is a deal memo, albeit short, but a deal memo with what we said were the major deal points. In addition, in, that, in, the, in the case, there were five long forms drafted, the fifth of which was execution copy, which the uh, lawyer for Kim Basinger admitted on the stand incorporated all her changes. So you have a final execution copy that is actually, although, albeit not signed, but it's completely and utterly negotiated. So um, we, we met with witnesses. We, uh, Carl's deposition was taken. Obviously, Kim, Kim Basinger's deposition was taken. One of the fascinating things about Basinger's deposition is she um, was asked point blank, uh, are there uh, any other films for which you, where there isn't a signed agreement? And she testified under oath in her deposition and repeated it at trial um, that every movie she'd ever done up until this point, there was a signed long form. And when we uh, asked her to, after her deposition to produce those signed 
long forms, sort of holding our breath. She, there were none. There was one. Sorry, I misspoke. There was one. And the rest of them, she didn't even have a deal memo signed. So I'm saying to you, that was an untruth. She repeated that untruth at trial. When you asked her, well, were you fudging in your depot? Are you fudging at trial? Or were you fudging when you failed to produce any documents under oath as well that showed that you had signed long form agreements? She was, um, she started to cry. I don't know what else to say. Um, so it, if, if I, I learned well before then, but certainly in this case, discovery counts. Uh, discovery counts big time. Um, when we were at trial itself, which is always fascinating, I had a great judge, uh, Judge Judy Sherlin, who's now retired. Uh, she made a point of saying to the, uh, to the jury once it was impaneled, uh, ladies and gentlemen, an, an oral agreement is enforceable in California. Uh, one juror blurts out, um, turn off my cell phone, one juror blurts out, um, and, and, and she said, Do, does anyone have a problem with that concept? And one juror literally raises his hands and he says, you can't make this stuff up. In front of the entire impaneled jury, quote, my daddy told me that oral agreements aren't worth the paper they're written on. And, you know, you sort of die a little bit because that's, and he poisons the whole well, right? Um, but it was, um, it turned out okay. And she explained, well, that's not the law in California. And can you be fair and impartial, blah, blah, blah. And, and he said, yeah. So um, right before the case went to the uh, jury, after the case had been tried, and I'll tell you a couple stories about the trial itself, but right before it went to trial, they, the ICM got out uh, as a defendant under an agent privilege uh, and a, a, a view I don't happen to agree with. And I, there's some more recent law that's more helpful to our position than w was extant at the time. And we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, I will tell you that her agent, uh, her new agent, she had a bill block with her original agent who made the deal. And then she had a new agent from ICM who since passed away, who was a terrific guy. And he told uh, Kim Basinger in words or substance, Kim, the best thing you have going for you are your legs and your legs aren't in the motion picture, um, which was his way of saying, don't do it. He, uh, the, but, but ICM got out and before ICM got out and before the actual trial started, we went over to, at, at ICM requested a meeting and the head of ICM, and again, you can't make this stuff up, right out of a bad B movie, looks at Carl and I in a meeting and, and trial counsel for ICM and Kim Basinger were sitting at the other end of the table. And he looks at us and he says, quote, I'm not telling you, um, Carl, that you'll never work in this town again if you proceed with this lawsuit because that would be illegal. And I'm not saying that. I mean, I, <laughs> I looked at Carl and I, I said, I think we're being threatened. And, he, and, and he, uh, this head of the ICM uh, second in command jumps up and says, don't, uh, nobody's threatening anybody in, in words or substance. And the head of ICM repeats it and says, again, I wanna be clear, I'm not telling you, Carl, you'll never work in this town again because that would be illegal. I looked at Carl and I said, Carl, I think we're being threatened. And uh, Carl, it was, I think, shaking a little bit. And I said, let's go. And we walked out of that meeting. So there are all sorts of stories like this. Um, I, I it, it certainly wasn't my first trial, but it was a high, a high visibility trial. And, and one of the things that I need to make clear is that while I think that we lawyered it well, um, it, the truth is the jury found 12 zip that there was an oral agreement, but they found nine to three that there was a written agreement because of what I just described that all these, that the execution copy had gone out. So I, I, I 
I want to emphasize that it wasn't just an oral contract, but I also want to emphasize that triers of fact, whether they're judges or they're juries, they, they like pieces of paper. They, because it sort of, then it takes a, it t- so the judgment issue goes away a little bit and they, they can say, well, it's written down. Uh, and I, I, you'll, I've interviewed too many jurors over the years and they like pieces of paper. They, they understand what the law is, but you, you, it, it's best if you have something in writing uh, because it gives them a, a sense of uh, comfort that they're doing the right thing. Um, I'm glad to answer, Alex, any questions. Uh, I know you have some. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I have to say to you is that everybody says, how can, you know, you were the first one to have this success against a celebrity, which I'm sure is not true, number one. But number two, I don't know the facts, but I, I, I'm confident that's not true. But number two, juries need, Kim Basinger is gorgeous. She was then, I'm assuming she still is, gorgeous. And I used to, she used to walk into the courtroom every day and I kept looking for a flaw and there was none, none. Um, and actually at the end of the trial, this is just an, as an aside, I got a call from um, People Magazine and they wanted to do an interview with me. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I can, I'll be in People Magazine. And then they, 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 I pick up the phone and speak to the reporter. What did she want to talk about? She wanted to talk about what I wore every day to court and what Kim Basinger wore every day to court. And I said, I want to say this nicely and respectfully. It's insulting. You would never have that conversation with a man. I mean, really? Um, and she, um, we didn't do the, trust me, we didn't have the interview. But those are many, many stories I can, uh, and, and, and I, I need to emphasize, if it were Gregory Peck suing for profits on To Kill a Mockingbird, I'm not sure I'd take that case. That is a very tough case to defend because he's, he's the, you know, he's the guy. He's the, you know, everybody believes him. Um, I think that you, even with the jury, because we interviewed him afterwards, uh, with a 9-3 vote and a 12-zip vote, one of the things I'm convinced of is they need somebody to blame. And she, uh, Kim Basinger, was gorgeous and a celebrity, and I needed to have somebody to blame. So in our closing argument, one of the things we emphasized was um, you heard from one of her lawyers, uh, but you didn't hear from the lead lawyer. uh, And we just made, you know, optically had an empty chair uh, because he was afraid to testify because he's the one who was, he he let his younger younger partner be the sacrificial lamb and he wouldn't and didn't, didn't come forward and testify, which I think made a difference to the jury. And the jury also could blame the agent. They didn't really want to blame her. It's, it's the, and the analogy I used in my opening, uh, which the other side objected to after the fact, was that it, it, we all remember being on the third grade and, and the, the kid that was the most popular and, and uh, everybody sort of gravitated toward is the good looking one. Kim Basinger is a good looking one, there's no question. But she's wrong in this instance, ladies and gentlemen. She did a wrong to my client. Um, Anyway, I'm talking too long. Alex, please go ahead. Patty, that's very interesting. You were just touching on the area I wanted to start with, which is that um, whether or not, in general, is it a bad idea to sue celebrities? I I don't think so, Uh, if they deserve to be sued, of course. But I don't think people should say, oh my goodness, I've got a celebrity on the other side. Uh, don't take that case or certainly must settle it. I don't think so. I think you just, it's a function of presentation and it's a function of understanding the facts well enough to be able to point a finger, perhaps at somebody else who gave him bad advice uh, or um, uh, is viewed to be untruthful. I, I will tell you the, uh, the lawyer who testified for, um, uh, who negotiated the, the agreement largely, and who testified at trial for Kim Basinger was a very uh, 
honest, and at least in my opinion, forthright person, but the jury still would have preferred to blame her uh, and the agent um, rather than um, Kim Basinger. But no, I don't think uh, every case has to be evaluated on its merits, but do not turn away cases because the celebrities involved on the other side. In this particular case, is the fact that Kim Basinger is a celebrity, did it have any effect on the decision to actually file the lawsuit? Uh, no, uh, what, what affected the decision to bring the lawsuit was that the, uh, Carl Massacone, the producers of the picture, literally um, had uh, gone at, gotten her agreement, went out and pre-sold the a picture in a, in a foreign distribution with a lot of advances, lots of advances, and um, did the publicity, started publicity already involving Kim Basinger, so no, they, uh, and they had had somebody else pull out months before, uh, people don't remember that, but months before, and he simply, and, and, and put up with the notion, oh, I can't go after a celebrity, and decided, you know what, I'm biting the bullet, I, I, I'm not doing this again. It was really, really hurtful to his, the pocketbook, but also to uh, the contract. I read in the, the unpublished uh, Court of Appeal decision that the, I think the foreign pre-sales were around 7 million and the domestic were around 3 million. And according to IMDb, the film grossed only 1.7 with uh, another actress in the lead. And I gather Ed Harris was the original male lead and he dropped out. So, you know, to what extent do you think you were able to show that the uh, reduction in the value of the film was the result of Kim Basing it pulling out? Well, I wish it were my brilliant lawyering, but it was, um, we, we lost pre-sales, um, primarily because Kim Basinger at the time was actually even bigger uh, in foreign than she was domestically. So we lost those pre-sales and then tried to, and, and tried to get some of them back and got back just a, a minor portion of them. And domestically, uh, the, the, uh, the distributor, uh, completely just took out from under us the uh, amount of the guarantee because she wasn't going to be in the picture. So it, it really, really hurt. Sure. Um, had you previously litigated any cases where there were oral agreements, but nothing in writing, but in terms of either a deal memo or a long form? I um, have gone to, I had gone to trial uh, both before and since based on oral representations, more fraud cases than breach of contract. Uh, I think that um, most cases where there is a perceived oral agreement in, in my personal experience, which is all I'm talking about, have um, settled. But, um, but I have taken to trial both before and since cases where there were oral representations made, not necessarily an agreement that people relied on and, and were successful in pursuing a fraud claim. Um, during your initial investigation of the case, what facts or theories did you see as potentially decisive and did these views change during the trial? Uh, it was breach of an oral agreement, breach of a written agreement, not, nothing fancy. Um, I, I don't think there was, a, I, I don't, frankly, remember 100%, but I don't think there was a fraud theory. Uh, it was just, and there was an interference theory against, of course, ICM. I think you mentioned earlier, an awful lot of these type of cases do settle. Um, were there any meaningful settlement discussions apart from the uh, somewhat abortive uh, trip to ICM that you mentioned earlier? Was there, for example, any possibility of settling with uh, one of the defendants and continuing to sue the other? I had as I always do. I tried to settle before. I tried to settle during. I tried to settle afterwards. And there were people wouldn't talk. I, I'm not blaming the lawyer. The lawyer's just doing what the client wants. But it absolutely made every effort to settle the case, as I always do. Not, not, nothing peculiar about this. I, I have to tell you one anecdote, though, that was sort of fun. Um, 
the, the other side made a motion for the jury to go actually to the Writers Guild and see the movie. And we, oppo we opposed it because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, they see this movie. Especially we had a couple of older ladies on the, on the, um, on the jury. They're going to hate us. And they're just going to hate us. So we go, to, um, we go to the Writers Guild in a bus uh, and the, they see it. And I'm, I'm, of course, trying to get in a position where I can see the reaction on the faces of some of the jurors that I was worried about and um, couldn't really tell. At the end, when we, in, when we interview the jury, they loved going to the Writers Guild. They loved Jennifer Lynch, the young woman who was the director, uh, and loved her more after they saw the movie. Now, and then they could go home and tell everybody they saw this movie, Hollywood movie, you know. I, I can't explain it entirely, but my worst fears were not met, thankfully. I want to try and turn now to what we will be referring to as the agent privilege doctrine. And um, I'm going to, first of all, lay a little bit of groundwork here for those of you listening who aren't too familiar with the doctrine. Uh, I'm going to read out a passage from a, uh, an unpublished uh, decision um, from the district, uh, Northern District, California, back in February called Advisor versus Magisto, which gives a pretty good overview of what this doctrine is about. It reads as follows. As a defense to claims of intentional interference with contract, California recognizes a manager's privilege, which we also refer to as an agent's privilege, under which a manager or agent may, with impersonal or disinterested motive, properly endeavor to protect the interest of his principal by counseling the breach of a contract with a third party, which he reasonably believes to be harmful to his employer's best interests. The scope of this privilege is neither clear nor consistent and can take three different formulations, absolute mixed motive and predominant motive. In 1982, the Ninth Circuit considered the issue in Los Angeles Airways versus Davis, noting that no California decision had explicitly, explicitly addressed the situation in which an advisor is alleged to have acted with a mixed motive. In other words, with the intent to benefit his employer's interest as well as his own. And with no guidance from the California courts, the Ninth Circuit adopted the mixed motive test holding that as long as an advisor is motivated, at least in part, by the interest of the principal, the privilege applies. And the full extent of the Ninth Circuit reasoning reads as follows. We conclude that whereas here an advisor is motivated in part by a desire to benefit his principal, his conduct in inducing a breach of contract should be privileged. The privilege is designed to further certain societal interests by fostering uninhibited advice by agents to their principles. The goal of the privilege is promoted by protecting advice that is motivated, even in part, by good faith intent to benefit the principal's interest. We believe that advice by an agent to a principal is rarely, if ever, motivated purely by a desire to benefit only the principal. An agent naturally hopes that by providing beneficial advice to his principal, the agent will benefit indirectly by gaining the further trust and confidence of his principal. If the protection of the privilege were denied every time that an advisor acted with such a mixed motive, the privilege would be greatly diminished and societal interests it was designed to promote would be frustrated. We do not believe the California Supreme Court would eviscerate the privilege and we declined to do so. So in other words, they went and established the mixed voting test. Yeah, but Alex, let me, let me interrupt just for a second. What, just to make clear what, what the motive was here, what artic the, the alleged motive was. The alleged motive was, and it's clear, that ICM was not going to get a, um, a commission in connection with this project because the prior agent had made the project. Uh, had, had, had made the deal. And so what you have is you have a um, new agent not getting any part of that deal 
has other things lined up for which they will get their 10% commission. And that was the allegation that they, it, it, at best, it was a mixed motive. Uh, we thought predominantly a motive, the, the predominant motive was, I'm not getting paid for that one, so let's get her out of that and, and, and get something where I can get my 10% commission. Now, that was the thrust of our position. I mean, you, what you are arguing is that there was a direct financial interest by the agent in this, which is obvious to anybody. But given the fact that the Los Angeles Airways case said that a mixed motive is, uh, you know, suffices for the privilege, were you not facing an uphill battle all the way on this one? Well, to be, to be gracious, apparently, <laughs> because we, ICM was knocked out right before, as a defendant, right before uh, the jury. Uh, started deliberating. So I, I have, I hate to say, use the expression, mixed emotions about it, because I certainly get that reasonable people could have said to her, I don't think this is such a great career move. And she waxed eloquent about being in this movie before she was told that. But I, I, I get, and I get that. The truth is, though, that um, knowing that she had already committed, that's the thing. He, the, 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 the testimony was that the ICM agent picks up the phone, calls a lawyer and says, do we have, is, is this a firm deal? Because I don't think this is a good idea for her. And then the, um, the, the lawyer, I don't know exactly what was said. Uh, I, I, to this day, I don't know exactly what was said, but clearly I think the agent believed that he had license to do what he did and advise her not to do it. So it goes back to the lawyers again. And I, um, I, I, I'll never know exactly what that testimony was. I mean, that, that, um, uh, that conversation was. Had, had the advice not to do the film come from Miss Basinger's lawyer rather than her agent, it would have been privileged, would it not? Yeah, that's, we were, yeah, we've talked about that, 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 that lawyers, I guess the lesson to be learned is if you're an agent and you want to make sure that you, you're, you're, client doesn't act in something that they perhaps agreed to, uh, then make, have the message delivered by the lawyer because nobody will ever know. I, I, I don't like that kind of um, lack of transparency, but um, I, I think that, that it is a factual issue every time with this, whether the uh, agent privilege applies. Now, the unfortunate thing for you was that trying this case in 1993, you're halfway between the Los Angeles Airways case in 1982 and a subsequent California appellate court decision in 2003 called Hune versus View, VU, in which the California appellate court held that the predominant test was to prevail in future and uh, overrule the Los Angeles Airways case as being a a federal decision. Um, the predominant motive test shows that uh, basically all the, uh, the manager stood to reap a tangible personal benefit from the principal's breach of contract so that it is at least possible that the manager acted out of self-interest rather than the interest of the principal. The manager should not enjoy the protection of the manager's privilege unless the trier of fact concludes that the manager's predominant motive was to benefit the principal. And my understanding is that's currently the state of the law in California. Had that been the state of the law in 1993, can you see the uh, decision going the other way against AC ICM? I think I could see the decision going to the jury as opposed to the judge knocking ICM out. It should have gone to the jury. I think reasonable people could have differed about the factual conclusion, but I think it should have definitely then and I think now should have gone to the jury. And had I think it should go to the jury every time. Had there been any dispositive motions, you know, pre-trial on this point? Uh, there, there were, and they were denied pre-trial. She wanted to hear the evidence. Okay. Um, any, um, moving back to, onto the, the trial any do you have any money any mon monday morning quarterback thoughts with respect to how both sides litigated the case is there anything you would have done differently is there anything you think the other side should have done differently well i wouldn't be presumptuous enough to say 
what the other side should have would have done. Um, I think that the mistake I made is what uh, happened on appeal when we were in chambers discussing jury instructions. I made the decision. Um, the judge the judge turned to us and said, "Well, are you getting the judgment against Miss um, Basinger or her loan out company?" And we, uh, hedging my bets, being a conservative lawyer, I said both. And she, I convinced her that she should have, um, it should be and or, her, Kim Basinger and or her loan out company. Uh, and the Court of Appeal thought that was reversible error, which I take entirely, the entire responsibility for. I made that ju judgment call. And um, I think that the Court of Appeal is dead wrong. I mean, the, the, the notion that a loan out company and the individual for real purposes, uh, practical purposes in terms of decision making are two separate entities. I'm not talking about for taxes, but are two separate entities and therefore should the and or was wrong as a matter of law. Um, I think it's a wrong thing for the Court of Appeal to have done, but that I take full responsibility. And of course, with hindsight, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> but the, the the problem is that, it, and it, you know, the proof is sort of in the pudding that Kim Basinger went into bankruptcy. Her loan out company didn't. Her loan out company didn't have any money. So not I'm not sure as a as a practical matter would have made one iota a difference. Um, after the court of appeal uh, decision, uh, the case settled, did it not? It settled after she went into bankruptcy. Yes. And it was a, a good, not great settlement. Uh, at the time, I, I, I'm just remembering these anecdotes that one of the uh, things that I vividly recall was the jury, the, the pinning gallery was packed every day with reporters, blah, blah, blah. And, um, and Alec Baldwin, who was her then... I guess fiance, I mean, they, they weren't married yet, but they were about to be married, came to court every day. And Alec Baldwin at the time, I don't, I, I don't know now, but he uh, had a ferocious temper. And you could see that when he got angry, literally like the, the, his, from his neck up, he would get red. And my goal was to have him leap over the banister uh, from the peanut gallery and come over and grab my neck in front of the jury. I was close a couple times, but never, I never was successful. That's, that's one of my other regrets. <laughs> um, we've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to cut my questions short and move on to the, the uh, questions from our distinguished participants. So let me ask you this. Uh, what lessons do you think there are to be learned from the Boxing Helena trial? Well, if, if I'm speaking to lawyers primarily, I will tell you, please have a good time uh, when you're practicing law. I love trying cases. I love trying cases, Alex. And I, um, and I love the interaction with the jury. If you, if you like that, um, I, and, you, and you, um, you, know, you do your homework. If you do your homework and you like uh, being in a courtroom, it's, it's, it's like heaven. And you get paid for it. I mean, my goodness, it's fabulous. Um, but the, the, the people keep talking about oral, how, oh my goodness, it's the first case where oral agreements were, um, were enforced. That's just not true, number one. Uh, number two, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of honor in this town, in my judgment, and a lot of things are done on handshakes. And if I were having a conversation with you, Alex, and you said, I'm going to uh, do X, I could take it to the bank. There, there are three other people who I wouldn't trust them any further than I could throw them just based on experience. But it need, to facilitate business, uh, commerce in this town, so much of it genuinely is about relationships. And you need to have uh, the, the feeling that I can take your word for it and you can take my word for it, largely. And, and, and then you know the people that you can't take their words uh, for it. So, um, I do think it was a, high, a case that highlighted oral contracts. But please don't lose sight of the fact, 
and I've said it at the beginning, five long forms were exchanged and the last one was an execution copy. It just didn't get signed. So um, I do think paper matters uh, and I do think that um, hard work matters. So with that. Last question from me. Um, any advice for transactional lawyers about how to create enforceable legal obligations if the other side won't sign? Um, yeah, I, I actually, there, there are some tra entertainment transactional law firms who pride themselves on having their clients never sign a document, and, which I think is atrocious. I don't, I don't think that's the right way to conduct business. Having said that, I think that what you need to do is you need to document as much as you can and confirm conversations on, in writing as much as you can. And, and, and sometimes it's not the representative's fault when, they, when their clients back out or attempt to back out or say there was no agreement. It's frequently the, the, um, uh, the, the, the talent's fault. Uh, not always, but it, it, it frequently is. And you uh, need to document as much as you can so that you can shove this under somebody's nose if they try to back out and say, excuse me, we have a deal. Um, and and uh, reliance, justifiable reliance on a deal is not an important either. So again, in the Basinger case, um, it was repeated uh, and the jury bought it and should have bought it because it was true about the, um, the amount of money spent uh, in getting to where we were before she backed out based on her agreement to participate. And uh, the, again, the pre-sales, and then you can take the pre-sales, the foreign pre-sales, and then do sort of like a, okay, this is what reasonably you could, more you could have expected if she had been in the film. So um, I guess that's my answer, but I, I think document, document, document as much as you can, and don't um, be fooled into getting it, or sucked into this notion that people are exchanging drafts and therefore there's no deal. That's not okay. We all know what the law in, in California is about oral agreements. If major deal points have been agreed to, if the major deal points have been agreed to, then you got a deal. Do you recall whether or not the, what, what material elements were not agreed by the stage that uh, Basinger said she wasn't going to do the film? And one of our questions is well, an under, from, um, was whether or not there was an agreement on nudity and whether or not that was a material element of the agreement. That was a made up hokey excuse for there not being a material, um, all, all the material deal points not being agreed to. And it was agreed to, by the way, in the long form. But I don't, I, I frankly don't recall if, if what was mentioned about it uh, mm -hmm. in, the, um, in, in the short form agreement, a material deal point but I uh, know it was brought up repeatedly and it's, it was, in, in my judgment, uh, a completely hokey excuse. Um, another question from the audience. So what were the main arguments before the Court of Appeal and uh, how did the Court of Appeal uh, react during oral argument? Well, the main argument, well, the reversal was this and or thing. That was, that was the main thing that, they, they were okay with the damages. They were okay with all of the, uh, in my recollection anyway, substantive points. The big point that they reversed on was this and or, and I perhaps wrongfully consider it to be a, a, a wrong opinion, not unthoughtful, but a wrong opinion by the Court of Appeal because it ignores the realities of our business. And they stuck, they stuck to this notion that, um, uh, I, I want to say this correctly. They stuck to the notion that there are two different legal entities, a human being and a loan out company. And uh, as long as everybody's ob observed all the corporate niceties, you have to treat them separately. Uh, I think that may be true, certainly for tax purposes uh, and maybe for the conduct of other kinds of business, but it can't be uh, that the loan out company didn't want to do the deal and Tim Basinger did want to do the deal. So I've got to, I have a tension between that. I mean, that's just nonsense as a, as a practical matter. So uh, as far as the rest of the issues on appeal, were there, was there any discussion or any advocacy about any of the other points or was it really all about the and or issue? 
I think the main, uh, the, the other uh, critical point that the other side attacked was the damages. Uh, and I don't, I just don't, uh, we had a, a very good expert who um, testified about how he arrived at the, uh, the, the, the damages based on both projections and, and the, ju the trial judge, they, they made motion after motion to exclude all of that based on the speculative nature, but no surprises. And we, our expert was very believable and had done his, it was a his in this case, a his homework. And uh, the, the jury absolutely believed it. And the, I think the Court of Appeal was fine with it too. I, I think, again, the one thing they weren't fine with was the Andor. I mean, it seemed to be a very solid damages claim. You know, if you lost your pre-sales and the film ended up only making a fraction of what everybody expected it to make, you had a pretty strong argument there, did you not? Well, you didn't know how much the film was going to make at the time. Okay. So that, that's, that, that didn't, uh, that's not true. But we okay. did know the pre-sales we lost both domestically and foreign. Um, another question here. Um, how did the uh, case, how did it, you escape arbitration? Was there no arbitration clause in the long forms? No, there was not. Sign of the times. Uh, definitely. Although, if I can just do one minute, of, I, I'm a big believer in jury trials. Yeah. I think that juries, whether it's an entertainment case or a bank case or a real estate case, my, my personal experience, which is all I can talk about, I can't do... I'm not talking about personal injury. I'm not talking about criminal cases because it's a different ball of wax. But with commercial cases in almost every industry that I've tried, uh, juries get it right 99% of the time on liability. They go a little off, um, you know, off the beaten path when it comes to damages because if they get really riled up, sometimes they do... I mean, you know, they, a, a average juror makes 70, if you're lucky, 100 grand a, a year. Uh, and this is a little bit like monopoly money to them, but, but they want to do the right thing. They struggle to do the right thing. And I think it is, um, I, I urge people, lawyers, to not immediately think that, you, that arbitration is the way to go because arbitrators are arbitrary and juries, um, work their tails off to get it right, in my, in my opinion. And I'm going to give you one example, and then I, 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 I know that other people have questions. One example is that uh, we, we interviewed, I had a, um, a 10B5 case in federal court, and we interviewed um, the, the jury afterwards, and it's a six-person jury, uh, not a 12-person not a, not a jury in, in federal court. And did our closing arguments. I thought we had just a slam dunk. It was so good. The jury's out day one, day two, day three, day four, and we get to the fifth day. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, did I get this wrong? And um, the jury comes back on the fifth day of Friday, comes back uh, in our favor. Uh, and I interviewed them afterwards. And I, you know, half jokingly said, ladies and gentlemen, what took you so long? And the response was a gentleman who um, w was a Filipino, um, but recently an uh, American citizen, stood, identified himself as such. And he stood up and he said, you know, Ms. Glazer, you didn't just sue them, the other side, for breach of contract. You sued them for fraud. And I made the jury go through the evidence twice to make sure we got it right. I mean, you gotta love that, right? That's what our our system is. It, the jury system works; it really does. Anyway, I'm, I'll get off my my. Uh, I remember listening to you doing a panel probably about 15 years ago, and that one thing I remember from that is you're saying that you know whenever you had a client who wanted to make fraud allegations against a defendant, you know, you regard it as something of such. Uh, you know, importance for want of a better word, that wherever a client wanted to do that, you would normally have the client verify the complaint. I don't know if I misunderstood you at the time, but no, that's was that, your, was that your practice? Is it still your practice? 
Yeah, but you can't do that in federal court. So the, the answer is yes. Um, when you allege fraud, um, I'm, I, I, I think most lawyers, I'm not, I'm not peculiar to me, want to get it right. And um, we've looked at the documents our client has brought us. We've spoken to our client, but we haven't spoken to the other side. And um, the documents support what the client says, and we sue for fraud. Yeah, I want the client to understand this is serious. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it brings it home to them that you just don't go willy-nilly suing people for fraud. It's a serious thing to, to allege. Um, Judge Charlin is uh, one of, attending this program. Uh-oh, uh-oh has a nice comment, which I'm going to read out. She said, thanks for the nice comment. You might be interested that shortly after the trial, I was on a flight and Charlton Heston was seated across the aisle from me. We started talking and he told me that the jury really got it right and that he had done 64 movies and only had one signed written agreement and that was signed at the rap party. <laughs> I, have to tell, I have to tell one more Judy Sherlin story. All right. Uh, uh, so we have a witness who was a, a, an employee of uh, Miramax because they were going to be a domestic distributor. And this is a kid, and he was beyond scared to death, beyond terrified. And he, uh, I said to him, um, what can I do to make you more comfortable? And practically nothing. But he get, he, we decided he would just look at the jury. That's what he was supposed to do. Keep your eye on the jury. Don't don't worry about opposing counsel. So what he does is he, he takes a witness stand and he fixes his gaze right above the jurors' heads. And he does not move from keeping his gaze right above the jurors' head. And the opposing counsel, who is a very good lawyer, but opposing counsel starts moving around the courtroom to get him to move his gaze to him as opposed to above the juror's head. So finally, the opposing counsel says uh, to the judge, Your Honor, I need a sidebar. Comes up to the sidebar and says, uh, in words or substance, he, he says, I can't get this guy to look at me, and I'm walking all over the courtroom. He needs to look at me when I'm cross-examining him. And Judge Sherlin very wisely looked at opposing counsel and said, where is that written? <laughs> and And... We finished the testimony, and he never once looked at opposing counsel. His gaze was directly above the juror's head. And the jury liked him. Figure that one out. Um, here's another question. Are bench trials preferable when litigating against celebrities? Uh, no. I think, I think that... Uh, uh, you could have answered that one already. I, I, yeah, I... I it's an interesting question because I think uh, triers of fact, whether they be judges or juries, are sort of, um, uh, one, it probably depends on the celebrity, but two, uh, I think that um, judges are just as swayed by the star power as, um, as, as jury. Um, I think it depends on the, ju the, the judge, right? Because uh, some judges could care less, and you, even if they cared, they wouldn't. It wouldn't matter. We we had a case against years ago against Disney, a, a trial uh, by Judge um, uh, Rafiti, federal court, and um, my client insisted that we call Michael Eisner as a witness, and I'm thinking to myself, it's got practically nothing to do with this case. What are you talking about? And plus, I'm afraid the judge will fall in love with Eisner because he can be charming. He's like an absent-minded professor on a witness stand. And he came and testified, and I, I touched him a little bit, but not huge. And the judge was uh, ruled in our favor. But it was, uh, it was agonizing because I, I've got a guy on the stand who I really don't have that, you know, that zinger cross-examination because there isn't anything to, to zing him with. But it, it, I don't think it, uh, I, to answer the bottom line, I think it depends on the, on the uh, celebrity and I think it depends on the judge. Sure. 
Another question. How effective are reliance letters when a party doesn't sign an enforcing boilerplate of a fully negotiated agreement? How Do the first part of that question again. How, how what? How effective are reliance letters? Are you familiar with that phrase? The reliance letter meaning are, we have now pre-sold uh, the film I mean that, that sort of thing? Uh, I'm not sure I understand what a reliance letter is. I believe we're relying on, you know, your, our understanding that we have a firm agreement. I assume that's what we mean. Well, I, I think they can be helpful depending on the circumstances. And if somebody writes back, you got to be a little careful. Somebody writes back and says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't, you can't rely on anything we've done so far. We don't have a deal yet. So you got to be a little careful about that, but they can be helpful if they're not responded to in a negative way. Um, here's another question. What is the story about the court clerk and the mid-trial birthday party during the trial? Do you know about that? The mid, uh, mid-trial what? You know, what is the story about the court clerk and the mid-trial birthday party during the trial? I don't know anything about the latter. Um, it absolutely, uh, to the horror of everybody, uh, the court clerk made a mistake in judgment and a actually asked for a loan from, <laughs> um, I don't remember, it was Alec Baldwin, from the judge may remember, uh, and Kim Basinger or one or the other. Uh, and um, uh, obviously the judge had nothing to do with that. And we, it was a terrible uh, judgment call, but it had nothing, no impact on the jury. The jury didn't know about it. Um, but it was, it was a, I, I have not seen that before. I haven't seen it since. And I'm sure she regrets it to this day. It was a very bad thing to do. Yeah. But I don't know the mid-trial party that they're referring to. Uh, what's your advice on how to present a loss or a reversal of a win to a client? Is there always a fear that it will deteriorate the client relationship? Um, so if I understand the question correctly, I have a, um, a colleague who's not a lawyer. We both worked for the same client uh, for years, um, Kirk Kerkorian. I was his personal lawyer. This other fellow was a close, like his right, right hand, right arm. And um, when we would go to court together on a matter for uh, Kerkorian, this guy, uh, especially the beginning when they had pay phones instead of your own little cell phone, uh, walked just as fast to the pay phone when we won as when we lost. And the, uh, and the I always respected that because I think clients respect that. Now, nobody likes losing. So you can't keep going back to the client and saying, you know, I, I, we lost again. Uh, that's not a good thing to do. But on the other hand, uh, it is incredibly important to be transparent with your clients, in my opinion, and be completely and utterly uh, forthright. Uh, but you better, you better win some so you keep the client. That's all. Another question, would an agent have liability to the client if he advised a breach, knowing that he's in a privileged position, but didn't advise the client of the potential breach of contract by the client? In other words, if he fails to advise the client that he'll get out under the agent's privilege, but the client may be stuck with a, uh, with a breach of contract. I, in what's the liability in my view? Yeah, would, the, would, it, would an agent have liability for not instructing the client about that? I mean, that's more perhaps more of a uh, question for a lawyer than an agent. I don't think uh, agents have many rules, so I can't, um, I honestly don't, I've never seen an agent sued for that. Yeah. Um, and I do think the lawyer, especially for the bigger names, because they all have, have lawyers, personal managers, agents, someone um, undoubtedly told them or should have told them, but I think the lawyer is going to get stuck with that more than the agent is. If I'm answering the question. Yeah, no, I think you are. You are absolutely. Um, um, last question. How, where do you see um, the boxing Elena trial in terms of your career? Was this one of the highlights for you or was it helpful in building your career and your practice? Can you talk a little bit about that? 
Uh, fair question. I, um, I thought I was a pretty good lawyer before, um, and, uh, th but a perception in this town, as we all know, is sometimes as important as the actual, hopefully, quality. Uh, quality, not equality, quality. Um, so from a perception standpoint, sure, it was great for business. Uh, no question about it. I, I don't think, um, I, I, and, and did I learn a lot from trying the case? I learned a lot from trying all cases. I mean, I really do. I mean, I'm, and I'm totally receptive to, to learning a lot. So I, I don't, uh, I, I, I would be both foolish and probably not telling the truth if I simply said I was doing fine before then, I was doing fine before then. Having said that, from a perception standpoint, it was from huge in terms of, um, I mean, the front page of Variety, when the jury came back, uh, says in, in, a, in a big, big headline, uh, Basinger loses an arm and a leg. Okay? And that's, I mean, that's invaluable, right? I've got it hanging in my office. So, um, um, yes, it, it was uh, helpful from certainly a perception standpoint. Well, I, we've just about run out of time now. So I want to thank you very much for a, an incredibly interesting and instructive hour. I could continue for a lot longer. Uh, but unfortunately, this is our time slot. So on behalf of everybody um, who's been listening today, there's lots of very appreciative comments in the chats and the q and I I want to thank you, Patty, very much for your time uh, today, your time preparing for it. And thank you very much indeed. And just a note to everybody out there, our next war story is going to be July 29th, and the speaker will be Tom Girardi. So we hope we see you on that one. Say, Patty, hello, say hello to Tom and Alex. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everybody. That's it.